Right, I'm back again. Hello, everybody. And that was a slightly artificial. Hello. Uh, hello, Henrietta. Nice to see you there. Uh, slightly artificial. Normally, Beverly Minster's the church you can see in the background. And normally I'm in my office at home and the bells interrupt the hour and every quarter hour during the seminars, interrupt or introduce them. Uh, today I'm in Lincoln, in my office in Lincoln. Uh, and the bells are too far away, so I had to use a recording of the bells. Nevertheless, it marks the start of this, the fourth or fifth, I should know, uh, uh, seminars in the series of the International uh, Society for Research on Solitude. So welcome everybody. Uh, we are recording this, so and that should show on your screen. If you do not wish to be recorded, then of course you can turn your camera and sound off, uh, but it will be recorded and the recording will be later uploaded to the ISRS uh, website. So people who can't be here today, and I know a number of people have sent apologies, um, will be able still to see, see the talk. So I am Julian Stern. I'm uh, president, I think, of the International Society for Research on Solitude. And myself and Goshia Verweko, who is the vice president of the society, uh, being the, uh, the president for vice, she's unfortunately not so well today, so she will not show herself. Uh, but also with Rafa uh, uh, Ivansky, who is the secretary of the society, uh, the three of us are uh, juggling all our different roles and presenting uh, the seminar today. Uh, and we will be talking, uh, hearing and talking with uh, I know, uh, with uh, Anne Peary, who is going to be uh, talking on finitude, 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 solitude and the renewal of generosity. And following her talk, we will be uh, talking with her about that. And then I hope we'll be able to talk about other issues in solitude research and the issues that we're coming up with so that this becomes also a meeting, a group meeting, a, a, a chat about wider things. Um, first of all, though, it's my huge pleasure to introduce uh, a, a wonderful scholar and a wonderful friend as well, Dr. Anne Peary from the University of West of Scotland, uh, an excellent writer and talker to talk about finding, uh, sorry, uh, Anne, you're going to have to tell me whether it's finitude or finitude for finitude, you. I think. <laughs> and solitude and the renewal of generosity. Because Anne is, as you will hear from her accent, perhaps Scottish and based in Scotland, I am wearing my tartan tie. I am entitled to wear this. I have Scottish blood. Uh, so I'm wearing, uh, in your honour, Anne, I'm wearing that to make a connection. So I will now uh, shut up and uh, give the floor to Anne. It's good to see you, Anne, and welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm, I'm particularly thanks to, to Julian and Gosha and Rafael for inviting me today and putting up with my various requests. I'm mischievously. Can I just check? Can you all hear me? OK, yeah, you can all hear me. Yeah, I mischievously um, expected the bells of Beverly Minster to chime. And then, you know, when, when you have these Hollywood moments and you think you imagine how things might be. And then I would start off my talk like this. So imagine in your head the bells of the Minster chiming 4 p.m. And now I'm going to start. No man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. I'm going to skip a few lines. Each man's death diminishes me, for I'm involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. That was written by John Dunn in 1624, and it appeared in a collection called Devotions for Emergent Occasions. Um, I wanted to start with that because in many respects, the short extract from that poem, For Whom the Bell Tolls, does much of my work for me. It foregrounds how we are alone together. And never more fundamentally, I shall try to argue, than towards the end of life. 
It is often said, particularly in our modern societies, that we are born alone and that we die alone. I'd like to challenge that assumption, if I may. What I have to say today relates to another devotion for an emergent occasion, um, which is a convivium, a lovely word, a convivium, uh, which is a kind of alternative form of academic gathering that foregrounds conviviality rather than the presentation of ready-baked academic talks for a, a young colleague who is um, terminally ill. He's, he's 43 and he's facing, he has a, a very poor prognosis. Um, and at his request, the, the, the focus of the event, which will take place on Saturday, which might explain my distracted, if I'm slightly distracted today, that might explain why. Um, the focus is on finitude, the arts and education. We've chosen the word finitude uh, to broaden it out beyond the imminent demise of an individual in this case, to look at endings in a, in a larger scale. Um, so we'll see how the, how the the, the, the conversations go on Saturday. A brief, I want to start with a, a brief observation on the renewal of generosity that has been so evident, that's form, it's part of my title, and has been so evident in the discussions between colleagues in the run up to the event. I shall draw on um, a most unlikely alliance between the musician and visionary artist Laurie Anderson. She's impossible to pigeonhole and I'm using her self-description, and Sigmund Freud, for whom, with whom we are perhaps more familiar, at least by reputation. So Heart of a Dog is a, it's called a cinematic tone poem. We're going to watch a short extract from it in a second. Um, it's a cinematic tone poem, is how she describes it, about death, loss and mourning ostensibly dedicated to the filmmaker's dog, her beloved rat terrier, Lola Bell, but also to her mother and her illustrious husband, the late Lou Reed. Um, so I, want to, I wanted to, to bring this to your attention because I think it, it challenges part of the agenda for Saturday. Uh, and one of the things I want to bring to the table on Saturday is challenging this notion that we can use a set of con um, conceptual resources developed in one field, philosophy in this case, and then apply them to an aesthetic object. I think there is much to be lost in doing that. And I think when we look at a clip of this film, which we'll do in a second, you'll see how difficult to categorize it is. Um, so if we could, could we watch a clip of it now, Julian? This is the trailer for Heart of a Dog. I seem to have lost you all. Are you still there? Sorry, can you, can you see it now? I'm afraid I can't see anything. Yes. Oh, yes, I, yes. Yes. Okay, some people can. I'll play it and see if it comes up for you, Anne. Okay, great. And the others. Yeah. Thank you. I, I can no longer see anyone, but I'm going to carry on talking in the hope that you can hear me. Is that the case? We can see you and hear you. Good. I can't see you or hear you, which is very disconcerting. But it's fine. I'm used to solitude and I'm also <laughs> used to talking to myself. Um, so I hope you can see where I'm coming from with this. I, 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 I think it is the film. I would heartily recommend it. It's a mere 75 minutes long and watching it is a profoundly meditative experience. Um, it's a it's a film that touches one's emotions as well as um, excite one's intellect. And my misgiving about exploring um, 
an issue like finitude, um, using the arts as, a, as an instrument it is to miss the point. Let me continue with my script. I have a dreadful habit of moving off script. Laurie Anderson tells us that she suddenly understands the connection between love and death. She concludes that the purpose of death is the release of love. And this is something that I have experienced in the run up to Saturday's convivium at a time when someone can feel extreme isolation in that movement towards death. Um, it, it is actually a time of renewal of love and, and a, of a sense of a flourishing community. Sigmund Freud responded to the same phenomenon. His response to the same phenomenon is more prosaic, literally. For it appears in a letter dated the 12th of April 1929 that he wrote to his colleague Ludwig Binswanger, who was grieving for his son. Freud had, had suffered the untimely loss of his daughter Sophie some 12 years earlier. Freud points out that although the acute phase of mourning eventually subsides, the mourner can never be fully consoled. No matter, I, I quote from Freud here from this letter, no matter what may fill the gap, even if it be filled completely, it nevertheless remains something else. And actually this is how it should be. It is the only way of perpetuating that love which we do not want to relinquish. This speaks, albeit very briefly, to the theme of the renewal of generosity that appears in my title. It also signals that essence precedes existence. I'm going to read that again. Essence precedes existence. That was a phrase used by Vaclav Havel in his appearance before the joint session of Congress in the US in 1991. I want to explore it briefly with you here. If everything were about the larger forces, those that tell us that we need to move on, that we will get over it in time, that we need to get on with our lives, etc. Then one might be able to put aside grief once and for all. But we all walk accompanied by ghosts, as Laurie Anderson sings in the introduction to that little trailer we showed you. And it's our walking with ghosts that makes us who we are that form of being alone together, that the presence of those we have loved and lost is a haunting. And I also want to rehabilitate a haunting as something that's a positive thing, not something that we need to get over. Um, for the, the idea of getting over something um, is, for me, a more profound sense of loss. So I want to say now a little bit about each of the three terms of the title of the convivium, um, which is um, finitude, the arts and education. I'm going to start very briefly with education. Let's get education out of the way. Although I work in a school of education, I often find much of education rather dull. Um, I shouldn't really admit that in public, um, especially not when this is being recorded, but that's the case. As I said at the outset, I have deep reservations about the practice of drawing upon philosophy to provide an interpretive framework through which to address the arts. And the brief glimpse into the multi-layered film by Laurie Anderson is an early intimation of the paucity of such endeavours. There is not scope to address that here, so I shall do so obliquely through one of the characters who appears below one of the characters that will form the, the, the centerpiece of my talk today. First off, education. It strikes me that contemporary Western education systems seem in singularly ill-equipped to address the essential fragility and ephemerality of human life and the precarious nature of our rootedness to the earth. Lifelong learning, at least in the English language, lifelong learning, and education for sustainability are blithely discussed as if we were going to live forever in a world where finite resources can be stretched ad infinitum. 
and indicative counterfactuals, for example, you could be a brain surgeon if you work hard enough, are the norm at all stages of compulsory schooling and beyond. Can I just pause here for a moment and speak to you as if I could see you, that's another counterfactual, and ask for to come out with expressions in your own languages. Is lifelong learning, is it a particularly Anglo expression? Are there, are there equivalent expressions in Polish, for example? Or is it a term of art restricted to the Anglosphere? There is a saying in Romanian. Yeah, how is it sound in Romanian? Uh, as you live, you learn something like that. OK, OK, OK. But you're, you're, your language is probably not as bleakly technicized as English, um, where, where lifelong learning is one point nine. But, uh, if I can throw in a piece of anecdote, which is not on my script, um, Cardinal Basil Hume, who was the, um, Julian will know more about him than I do, much more, but he was for a time the head teacher of a prestigious private boys school in the north of England. And he is reputed to have said, we're not preparing the boys for death here, uh, for life here. Sorry, a Freudian slip. It's allowed. We're not preparing the boys for life. We're preparing them for death. And um, I would like to see compulsory education prepare students more adequately for death, more adequately to recognize their own finitude. Because I think it's only through recognizing our own finitude that we truly appreciate the nature of our relations with the human and non-human world. Finitude, now to get to my, my second term, finitude. Um, and here I'm referring to the death of an individual rather than the exhaustion of planetary resources. Finitude in its relation to solitude, as I am mindful of my audience and, and and of my, um, that I am an imposter when it comes to um, research on solitude studies. I, I'm, here, uh, I'm here among experts and I'm in the invidious position of speaking to experts as a non-expert. But I'm going to carry on because my next reference is to a book called How to Be a Failure and Still Live Well by a theologian called Beverly Clack. And she points out that the emphasis on success, personal growth, and the relentless individualism that pervades many spheres of our lives, work, education, also manifests itself in the movement towards death. The latter, she argues, is treated as a phenomenon concerned only with personal survival. She points out the negative consequences of this rampant individualism as follows. If the individual, their needs and wants, their hopes and achievements is placed center stage, it is difficult not to see death as anything other than obscene, for it reveals the insignificance of that individual when viewed from the perspective of cosmic forces over which they have little or no control. In the extended piece I have written in the run up to the convivium, I explore the dimension of being alone together in the movement towards death through the personal accounts of the philosopher Richard Rorty and the screenwriter and TV dramatist Dennis Potter and through an account of my own father's passing and what that taught me about essence preceding existence. I know I'm open to the charge that these are all men, but frankly, that's purely contingent, as is much of my work. First up, Richard Rorty. In 2007, shortly after the publication of his essay, Pragmatism and Romanticism, Rorty was diagnosed with inoperable pancreatic cancer. In The Fire of Life, a short essay published posthumously in Poetry magazine later the same year, 
he explained that in all his previous philosophical all he explained that all his previous philosophical endeavored endeavors seemed to have little bearing on his current situation i suggest that perhaps he had an inkling he had some indication or intimation of the idea expressed so cogently by Cora Diamond in her essay, The Difficulty of Reality and the Difficulty of Philosophy. Namely, that an understanding of the kind of animal we are is present only in a diminished and distorted way in philosophical argumentation. Rorty explained that he had no quarrel with Epicurus as he agreed that it is irrational to fear death nor had he any beef with Heidegger, he didn't disagree with Heidegger. It was just that neither ataraxia, freedom from disturbance, nor sein zum Tode, being towards death, quite seemed to cut it. Rorty was facing up to the ultimate difficulty of reality for a philosopher, namely that to attempt to think in the face of impending death is to find one's thinking become unhinged. Dismayed to see his father cut adrift from the anchorage of philosophy, Rorty's son asked him whether there hadn't been anything he'd read that had been of any use. Poetry was the sudden and unequivocal response. Rorty referred specifically to two old chestnuts that he had recently dredged up from memory and had been oddly cheered by. Rorty's response is interesting. For despite his protestations to the contrary, it seems to mark a retreat, in my view at least, from the hermeneutic universalism with which he's generally associated. Richard Schusterman uses the, this term to refer to the idea that interpretation constitutes the whole of understanding and meaningful experience. There is little doubt that Rorty regarded poetry as ineliminably linguistic, and that he was initially skeptical that it provided privileged access to an emotional or cognitive state, let alone that it operated on a level that was not purely linguistic. In short, he tells us that he did not fear having missed out on truths that are incapable of statement in prose. For instance, he remained convinced, and I quote again, there is nothing about death that Swinburne and Landor knew that Epicurus and Heidegger failed to grasp. Yet there's something really intriguing for me, at least, about his admission that he wished he had spent more of his life with verse. This is an eminent philosopher making this in, in, in his 75th year. He wished that's a big, it's a big statement. He wished he had spent more of his life with verse. There's also something interesting about the wistful claim that he would have lived more fully had he been able to rattle off more old chestnuts, so he may have been able to recite more verses, more poetry, if he'd taken more poetry into his body, as it were. Um, he would have lived more fully, just as he would have done had he had more friends. Old Chestnuts is a mildly pejorative reference to the um, most quoted lines of Swinburne's Garden of Prosperine and Landor's on his 75th birthday. The latter title is very poignant given that Rorty died in his 76th year. He tells his readers that he found comfort in those slow meanders and those stuttering embers. So there's something anti-discursive Im embedded in, in that discursive form. And that he suspected, this is interesting too, that no comparable effect could have been produced by prose. He brings our attention to the concluding lines of Landau's poem. Nature I loved, and next to nature, art. I warmed both, both hands before the fire of life, it sinks and I am ready to depart. He observes that in lines such as these, I'm quoting again, all three conspire to produce a degree of compression and thus of impact that only verse can achieve. So you see what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to find a safe space 
to argue against my dying friend. But I need to have this discussion. I need to, because my own background is in the humanities and um, I, um, I want to foreground that aesthetic experience. So Rorty concludes that compared to the shaped charges contrived by versifiers, even the best prose is scattershot. And this is from a professional philosopher. It's fascinating to me. What he seems to be suggesting here is that poetry conveys something that touches our essence, our deepest core, um, as well as shedding light on factors that govern our existence. And that poetry is not bound solely by discursive logic. Rather, it compresses the immediate, rendering it more vivid. Yet it also exceeds it by summoning up experiences that lie beyond it, gesturing towards the unsayable, the unnameable, the eternal, the eternal. And then I'm going to drop this line by Anne Michaels from her novel, although that's hardly a way to describe this book called Fugitive Pieces. This, I'm going to read it very slowly. I might even read it twice. I believe in the power of incantation. A poem is as mural as love, the rut of a rhythm that veers the mind. I need to read this again, forgive me. I believe in the power of incantation. A poem is as mural as love, the rut of a rhythm that veers the mind. The paradox of poetry is that like music, it is a direct and immediate experience that does not require reflection or a conscious choice on our part, despite its discursive qualities. It has a transcendent quality, allowing us to bridge the gap between reality and an ideal state, however fleetingly. Um, in Andy Musik, Schubert and the lyricist von Schubert suggest that in our greyest hours, music kindles love in our hearts and transports us to a better world. Poetry, I suggest, also gestures beyond itself, and yet it points back to itself, partly through its sonic and rhythmic qualities, partly through its self-conscious use of language. Poetry is, those, is thus both verbal and nonverbal a counterfactual art form par excellence. And I'm sure Julian would agree that I love paradoxes. Um, that's just one little thing I wanted to add here. So in terms of, for my solitude specialist audience, what I'm trying to say, I think, is that in times of life when we are perceived to be profoundly alone, um, are, are the aesthetic experience, the aesthetic frame, not the aesthetic frame viewed through some interpretive framework, can somehow connect us with something that is larger with ourself. It doesn't take away our pain, it doesn't make us get over it or move on, but it somehow enables us to have this transcend, to transcend it in some way. Um, how am I doing for time, dear friends? I can't see you. Um, can I go on for a little longer? Yes, do uh, do, uh, do carry on. Uh, Thank you. We've had about half half an hour. OK, I will um, possibly accelerate and not deviate anymore. Um, I'm sorry, I'm. OK. Um, I'm going to skip um, Rorty and moving on to Dennis Potter. There's going to be some um, histrionics here, but I will try not to be too histrionic. This sense of, oh God, I have to read this. Um, yes, Rorty was talking about exposing himself to the ineffable magic of rhyme and rhythm in a way that made him feel more fully human by foregrounding essence over existence. It seems that in facing up to the difficulty of reality made manifest in his impending death, Rorty sensed that the limits of discursive language and the vital importance of our relationships in making us who we are. 
This sense of relatedness in terms of our relationship to the natural world is also discernible in my second vignette, which concerns the dramatist and screenwriter Dennis Potter, who also succumbed to pancreatic cancer, albeit in 1994, when he was 59. In a television interview recorded two months before his death, he confided to the journalist Melvin Bragg, between sips of champagne, this is not champagne, I'm pretending, drags on a cigarette, and the occasional swig of liquid morphine that had been working flat out in the months since his diagnosis. He worked in the early morning because he was done in by the evening. Listening to that marvellous life-enhancing interview, one might conclude that Potter was working to earth his heart. That phrase is borrowed from the poet and philosopher Denise Riley, who in Time Lived Without Its Flow has written with scintillating exactitude on that acute sensation of being cut off from any temporal flow after the sudden death of a loved one. If Riley's theme was the experience of living in arrested time following the sudden death of her adult son, Potter's theme is the apparent inability of the living to dwell in the present moment. We're the one animal who knows we're going to die, he tells Bragg, and yet we carry on paying our mortgages, doing our jobs, moving about, behaving as though there's eternity in a sense. And we tend to forget that life can only be lived in the present tense. It is, is and it is now only. He points out that while we would like to call back yesterday and yearn to and ache to sometimes, we can't. Potter draws attention to the fact that however predictable our lives are, and for many people they're all too predictable, there's always an element of the you don't know. He describes looking out on a plum tree in blossom in, in the garden in, of his home, and he tells us that what he sees instead of the usual nice blossom is the whitest, frothiest, blossomest blossom that there could ever be. This is a sublime example of the nowness of everything, the undoubtedness of beauty, and the realization of one's very essence as a human being, as the forces that govern one's existence pale into insignificance. There is an implicit tension between dwelling in the nowness of everything and the drive to work flat out. The particular difficulty of reality that Potter was experiencing resides in, I'm quoting Cora Diamond, the apparent resistance by reality to one's ordinary mode of being or mode of life, including one's ordinary modes of thinking. It is as if Potter sensed he was being shouldered out of how he thought. He was being pushed away from how he thought, how he was supposed to think and how he was expected or expected to act. His reference to the whitest, frothiest, blossomest blossom that there could ever be, glimpsed in the face of the torment of reality, is especially poignant. That a writer of his caliber only had recourse to superlatives is perhaps an indication of, diamond again, the inability of thought to encompass what it is attempting to reach. And there's a line from a Leonard Cohen song, the last from a last album that makes exactly the same point, but I haven't got it in the top of my head at the moment. Paradoxically, the power of this expression, the blossomest of blossoms, lies in the fact that it vests itself with powerlessness, a further example of the counterfactual at work. I'm going to skip on and talk about the last example. Could we have that picture of my dad, please? Which I can't see, but you can, which is all very weird. Um, so Porter was, was haunted, living inside a contradiction. He's alive and never more alive to the world, and yet he has the embodied knowledge that he will soon be dead. And to work flat out, to work to earth one's heart, to do what one does with renewed intensity, is a way to live with such a profound sense of exposure. Do you have that? Uh, the, picture, the picture is there, Anne. The picture is there. That's another type of exposure. It's a, 
it's a, a shot, uh, it's um, uh, exposure caused the visual data that you're looking at. The photograph is an example of what Diamond refers to as the shuddering awareness of death and life together. The father is dead, the father is my father, the child in her blossomest of blossoms, in that brief period when I was a stunning blonde, is no longer present either, although it cannot be said that she's dead. For individuals, the biggest you don't know is probably the time of their own passing. Although, as we saw above, there may be a powerful intimation that the time is drawing near. My father, who died of lung cancer at the age of 57, turned out to be remarkably prescient about when he would die. He was a doctor, which probably explains it. According to my mum, dad looked at his chest x-ray sometime in oblique December, and pronounced with some certainty that he would not live to see the daffodils. And he was absolutely right. He died some two months later on February the 25th, before the daffodils were in blue, just before. I was six months into my brief and inglorious career as a secondary school teacher. In retrospect, there was one important thing I learned from my dad, or rather it was something he helped me to face up to, as this is not something I could learn. How can we engage with life when our futures are finite? Most of us do not have such a refined sense of our own finitude as my father did, but the question remains valid. I learned from his example, from the one thing he certainly did not set out to teach me, that it is only through engaging with our mortality that we can make sense of what is meaningful and what is not. And more importantly, in this forum, that we are forged through our relationships with others and thus we are never truly alone. My father's obituary was written at a time when it was more important to be good than to be good at something. We are told what he is interested in in his obituary. For the record, iron metabolism and experimental hemolytic anemias, atherosclerosis and lipid metabolism. But we learn nothing about his achievements in these areas. Reading his obituary in the British Medical Journal, it soon becomes clear that it was how he lived with what he knew, and that's a phrase I'm borrowing from a dear friend, Richard Smith, that made my, fr my father a good man than merely an accomplished physician. Ah, I must finish soon. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, it'll be another five minutes. Is that okay? I hope so. He was yes. an excellent teacher who taught by example rather than precept, his obituary informs us. His deep humanity, common sense and breadth of experience were a source of inspiration to his students, registrars and residents. His opinion as a consultant was valued by his peers and family doctor colleagues who relied on his sound judgment and ready assistance. His patients greatly appreciated his caring attitude and natural feeling of empathy. The reference to a natural feeling of empathy is also revealing, as it suggests that essence does indeed precede existence and that empathy cannot be taught, or if it can, then it only through example. But empathy can be learned. It can only be learned by spending time with people in the here and now rather than prioritizing existence and stretching uneasily towards a better possible self, someone who is good at something in a future that will never come because all we ever have is now. I've told you about my dad because I loved him and I'm sorry to have gone on, but I couldn't cut him out of the picture at this point. It's not so simple. It's that simple, to paraphrase Raymond Carver. Nearly at the end now. The striking thing of the, of the feature of the obituary is that it foregrounds essence over existence. The emphasis is on a character performing various roles, clinician, teacher, colleague, researcher, day after day, not in the superficial sense of going through the motions or demonstrating accomplishment, but simply by being there with and for other people. And that doesn't exclude sometimes being alone and acting alone. 
it's clear that my father lived in truth, to borrow a phrase from Havel and Timothy Snyder, um, and that he didn't have an eye on the larger forces that structure contemporary achievements, accolades, awards, and so on. He was there for, pe for people, his patients, his colleagues, and his family. He was there for them because he did not have a choice. This seems a paradoxical claim, um, this claim about his, his freedom, as choice is generally assumed to involve weighing several options and, and making an informed selection. Yet being free can put you in a situation where there is something you have to do, like being there for your colleagues, or in the case of Volodymyr Zelensky, not escaping when your country has been invaded. Being free is sometimes not being able to do otherwise, just as Potter could do no other than write. In a wonderful lecture about thinking about truth and freedom, American historian, the Tim, American historian Timothy Snyder argues that people come into being through a series of moral choices made across time with and for other people. The free person can't always run, whereas the unfree person always has the option to escape. Paradox here. The relational dimension I've tried to suggest is systematically underplayed in educational discourse, which construes choice as having a range of options, even although some of these turn out to be illusory, and focuses on individual achievement and attainment to the detriment of the relational element. While you can leave school at 16 without any qualifications, it's your choice. It's a kind of, you know, uh, the dice is loaded, to quote my, my, my um, the late great Leonard Cohen. Educational discourse downplays the fact that there are many people involved in making us the people we become, even if they are ghosts that we walk with. By emphasizing our independence and autonomy in education and in the movement towards death, we underplay the formative role of our relationships with others, uh, with, of our relationship with others, which is made manifest even in the darkest of times when we are or feel most alone. I love my dad because I am the way I am. I think I'll end at that point. Thank you for listening. And apologies if I've overrun. Um, thank you. Every, thank you so much. Every, every academic talk contains within it a sense of its own immortality, of course, so it can overrun is, is its own attempt at that, I think. And that was wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, I'll, as the chair, I will. Uh, Get the privilege of asking the first or the, or the power to ask the first question but i'm sure there are plenty of others i uh, i i used to work at a university where a colleague wanted to introduce death studies a degree in death studies uh, and the uh, deputy vice chancellor said uh turned it down and said couldn't you call it something else perhaps life studies uh, because he feared it would upset people. Uh, so universities too have their reluctance to talk about these things. So thank you for talking about mortality and, and death and dying. Uh, it's too easy to avoid it. I know one of my favourite philosophers, uh, Franz Rosenzweig, mm. said uh, in such a simple way, he said, most of us have two names. We have a, uh, a family name, that implies something lasting from before we were born till after we die. And we have a given name, which gives us our mortality. So our two names already represent that tension between eternity and mortality mm. in such a simple way. And I read it and I thought, why didn't, well, that's what makes him a better writer than me. Why didn't I think of that? And I wondered what it is you talked about Richard Rorty suddenly realising he was going to die. But of course, we all know we're going to die. What's the difference between knowing we're going to die and knowing we're going to die? That that point at which we, we know, is it a sort of, I'm, I'm interested in whether it's a sort of self-empathy, 
and empathy with ourselves. Uh, what's what's that? Because that moment, uh, Philip Larkin. So I'll throw another poet in. Philip Larkin said he couldn't understand why people around him were so happy when they all knew they were going to die. He was famously miserable most of the time, and he knew he was going to die. But it's as though he he, he couldn't work with that. But there is a difference for someone like Richard Rorty between knowing he was going to die intellectually and then knowing he's going. What's that difference, Anne? I think, well, um, I think it's possibly the difference between bearing it in mind and having a, a, an embodied knowledge that one's body and mind possibly, or one's body is feeling. I think, I think that's where it is. There's some, um, I do think in our, in our animal nature that we, that we, that, that we sense when, you know, when, when our time is drawing near, our time as we call it. Um, just a, another observation on death studies. Um, to me, having a, a field of inquiry called death studies puts, some, puts it out there, puts it over there, somewhere where we can go and study it, and then we can come back to life studies or social geography or philosophy or education, whatever it is, the other stuff. Whereas I think this bearing, this you know, that we're all, um, that we all carry within us and that we're all made through our relations with people who are no longer there, um, you know, is, is a way of, of keeping that with us. So your, your intervention was so long and complex and rich that I, I feel completely inadequate in terms of answering um, your question. <laughs> And that's that's my my problem. I'll hand over to more concise and I'm sure articulate. Thank you for it. Thank you. It's Thank so you. very but, interesting. Uh, any other either questions or or comments? Uh, David, David, you have both your hand and your yellow hand, and then Henrietta, I think. Okay. David, uh, welcome. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes. You, we can hear you. Oh, that's that's brilliant. Um, I, I shan't worry if you can't see me because that's uh, less attractive. Um, I was uh, I'm first apologise and apologise twice for asking a question when I didn't hear the first part. I was with a student, um, but I came in as you started to talk about Dennis Potter, and I I wanted to I wanted you to. Um, uh, perhaps develop that a little bit, um, uh, because again, without being um, uh, um, uh, particularly proud or, or uh, wanting to make a thing of it, I knew Dennis Potter very well. We were at university together. He was chairman of the Labour Club and I was a member of his committee. Um, and for about a year, uh, we worked together very closely. Uh, we also, uh, I was then married in my second year at, at Oxford, and um, Dennis Potter was getting married and had introduced his, quote, working class girlfriend to Oxford society without ever um, entering um, a meeting, without referencing her in that way as working class. Um, and that t tells you something, I think, about his particular way um, of seeing the world as an extension of self. So what I wanted you to consider um, is um, that uh, I, I'm not, a t I saw the interview on television that, that you're quoting, mm. and it was very striking, except that the thought that crossed my mind was, I wonder how many years Dennis has been working on to perfect exactly that uh, quote about blossoms. And it's really rather little to do with blossoms. It's to do with the fact that he was an extraordinary person, a great television writer, a great television dramatist, but he'd lived with the presentiment of death all his life. He introduced it into uh, many of his conversations. You could meet him in the street and you'd say, oh, 
how are things? What are what are you doing? And he would immediately say something like, "Ah, oh, death, disease, and destruction," uh, 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 as though he'd immediately come straight from the Amalekites, uh, who were about to be stricken down by the Almighty. Uh, he had psoriasis, which is. Yes. And just, oh well, but that was the the leading note of of his version of life. Now, what what uh, the point I'm making is: can you separate out the the reality of of that segment of his life without saying that was also a presentation? There are people who work with death pretty much all the time. There are people who do uh, see it in their relations with other people. And I'm pretty certain that Dennis was one of those those people. Is, is he at all a characteristic or, or likely role model for how other people approach um, the, the the reality of death because I think he he was someone who'd been thinking if you look at his written work it's there all through all through all through uh, um, and um, and the center point of penis from, from heaven isn't the music it's an unjust mm -hmm. and avoidable execution mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, this is a man who worked with death mm. <laughs> thank you David Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm blown away that you have such, um, you have, you know, you know this person actually in his personhood in a way that I never can. I mean, all I know, I mean, I, I do know some of the TV drama. I did know about his chronic illness. I'm just wondering whether, though, we are all more preoccupied with death than we, um, than we uh, admit. Uh, that's one thing I might say. And I, I suppose the point that I was making like, that struck me in that interview was this paradox that we're all, and I think it's become more acute in the decades since he died, that we're all pitching towards a future. Um, you know, um, qualifi qualifying ourselves, making ready for something for, for a possible future. Um, and at the moment, in, in ways that are actually diminishing our collective futures. Yes. So um, it, it was this part, I, I wanted to explore the tension between um, the working flat out, which initially I saw as paradoxical. Like, what is the point of working flat out when your life is, is coming to an end? In his case, it was really, I mean, he died two months after that interview. Yes. enjoy the blossom of the blossom but it's it's that he, he was doing what he because he could do nothing else that's what what he did he was just carrying on doing what he did intensely yes. but there is this you're right there is this paradox between um an intense focus on his own activity and yet uh, some kind of awareness of of the beauty of the world around him. You know, in, in the longer paper I have, I've been writing about this quite a lot recently. I make this connection between, you know, next to nature art. And I think Potter's in that interview, you see the next to nature art and you see the slightly solipsistic, self-centered, driven individual. And you also see his vulnerability. You, you hold all these in your awareness the whole time. Um, and it, it's interesting because it, Melvin Bragg, the, the journalist, for those not familiar with an English um, context, very experienced journalist now in his 80s, nominated that as his all time favorite interview, that his best interview. Um, so I'm, I'm like all literary people, I guess I've kind of flown off on a piece of blossom. Uh, and I make no apologies for that because it 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 makes sense in in the in the context of the thing I was writing. But I completely take your point, and thank you for your sharing your um, the details of your acquaintanceship with him. Thank I, you. I would only comment on that that I think Dennis would give a, a sly, very sort of uh, inward smirk on hearing that, and he would say, he would be considering 
well, that worked. It, it, was, it, <laughs> it, 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 it worked because of the sweat equity that I've put into making it work. That's really mm -hmm. good line. When I'm not dead, I shall use that again. Yeah, sure, yeah. you TV dramatist, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we're, we're not, we can't argue with him because he's dead. Yes. So, and you know. <laughs> as, in, as in courts, a dying declaration has, has, has weight in a court. Henrietta, you've, you've had your hand up patiently. Uh, what would you uh, like to say? You are still muted, Henrietta. I love this speech very much. I was first surprised uh, uh, of your comment on Rorty that he um, he considered old prose uh, fades or um, powerless in front of poetry. And, and I was surprised because uh, to me Rorty's writing is somewhat poetical. It's also very philosophical, but he couldn't he couldn't resist at moments. And I rem while uh, you were speaking, I remembered that uh, he said something like all our cultures are standing on uh, artesian gazers of metaphors, something like that. Very beautiful. Uh, I, I thought this was a very interesting standpoint because indeed uh, poetry has a, has a way of going to right to the essence. And uh, on this note of paradox, I was thinking while you were speaking about the, uh, the tension, uh, no, about the paradox, because it's a paradox, there's no tension there. In, it seems that in our lives we we uh, we also vividly feel this memento mori, this finitude, and uh, at the same time we uh, we live uh, we live the eternity of the present, so to speak. Uh, and this feeling of the eternity of the present is eased by uh, by love, by uh, the identification with a career or with a job as in the case of your father uh, or uh, with a role the role of the mother the role of the grandmother you feel the present moment differently and more powerfully in a way and if you if you're not very if you would agree and will allow me i would like to give you a a sense of a poem that talks about the eternity of the present. Mm -hmm. It's a poem by Mihai Minescu, and uh, it's not a very good translation because I couldn't find one, but uh, it goes like this. With tomorrow you extend your days, you reduce your life with yesterday, and you have all this in front of you. Always the day of the present, always today. When one passes, another day comes in this world to follow. Like when the sun goes down, he also rises someplace else. It mm. seems like other ways I always go down, the same one I see. It seems like another autumn, but the same leaves fall forever. Before us, night walks. Sweet morning uh, breadwinner, when death itself is an opinion and the treasury of lives. From any passing moment, I understand this truth that uh, it supports all eternity and the whole universe spins. That's why it flies this year and plunges into the past. You have the whole treasure now that you always had in your soul. With tomorrow you extend your days, with uh, yesterday you reduce your life. You are facing always the day to day. <laughs> the sparkling views, the rapid strings are scattered. They rest undisturbed under the ray of the eternal thought. Thank you for having patience with me. I thought this is very beautiful because uh, in a way the, the 
counterpart of our feeling of finitude is precisely this feeling of eternity. Our life is finite, but we have this string of eternal moments, so to speak. And it, it's something that we, I thank you so much. First of all, thank you for offering that. It felt like a gift and I'm not going to try any explication. I want to say it felt like a gift. Thank you. I would appreciate if you could write in the chat the name of the poet. I couldn't find the chat. I wanted to write you the whole translation. The chat is uh, it's not working for me. Yeah, too, if, you, if you email it to me, I will I'll do that. Down. I'll do that, of course. It's and my I, pleasure. Okay. I think it's it's one example of, of what Cora Diamond in this paper that I'm I, I keep getting drawn back to. You know, it's it's something that we can bear in mind but we actually can't think about. Because we are like other animals, we are we do live in the we are time, we live in the moment. We although we we project into a future that doesn't come. Um, I love the bit about the sun setting and it's but it's not actually setting, it's rising somewhere else. It's it's shadow mm -hmm. light. Thank you so yeah. much for that. I, I'm not going to attempt to say anything in response to it, just to thank you. <laughs> thank you too. It was a very, very wonderful talk. Oh thank you. <laughs> uh, anyone else we have uh, the, I, I realise people have uh, their pictures up are the ones who have been talking, but uh, of the other people, uh, Jill and Piotr and PH and uh, uh, so on, the others, anyone want to add anything? Uh, you can put your hand up or simply unmute yourself and talk away. Jill? I just want to say thank you so much for that. It's so wonderful to hear uh, an academic bring that personal experience into a talk because I think so often um, as academics we try to remain impartial uh, and I think personally for me I find that often the time that students have responded the best is when you give just that little bit of yourself Mm -hmm. um, and I have shared poetry with students in the past and it is those moments that that you are able to connect with them. And again, it's that not wanting to dissect them. My first degree was an English degree and I spent three years dissecting poetry and I didn't want to read it for years and years afterwards. And it was only when I came back to it and I started to see the value of the words in front of me in relation to my experience that I was able to um, to share that much more openly and freely with mm -hmm. students who could then respond from their experience. And I just wondered if you've had any experience of of doing that with students that you have taught sharing your your stories. Yeah, very much so. I actually shared. Um, I've written on Saturday we're going to do um, we're going to speak for seven minutes each. So I, I scripted something for speech. I don't often, I just often just talk, but I wanted to script something. And I um, I shared it with my dissertation students. We're doing something completely different. But I, I just say, you you have to start from your lived experience. You have to do a piece of, of um, practitioner research. You have to start with something close to your heart rather than to do something that you think will pay dividends or you think is a good topic. And and I also wanted to say to them this, that the piece of writing that I, I, I um, it's partly in what I presented to you, but it's, it's also, it's really around my father, far more around my father. And I've said, for me, this developed into something else. I've now written an academic article and you have to start from that place of interest. You have to start from that essence. You have to start. I'm sorry, I'm pointing at my, I'm pointing it's here. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> it has to, you know, come from your essence. And, and that, um, 
you know, from everything else that will follow. Whereas if you try and, and meet expectations that are not clearly defined in any case, you will, you know, you will falter and you will not be able to sustain the interest. I have seen uh, so many students who have, have had, a, a, it's, it, it's the blossoming of the blossom, who have had that spark of something and they're not able to articulate it in front of the expert. Uh, and they have been crushed by it. And I'm always reminded of the the Yeats poem, uh, which I come back to time and again. Again, it's that you spread my I've spread my dreams under your feet, tread softly. And I often think for students who are embarking on a life, that academia sometimes almost extinguishes that spark before they even get the chance to um, to be able to to blossom in any way. So I'm. I'm deeply moved by what you've said today and thank you. Just one follow up to that, um, if I may. Um, just this morning I wrote to a student. He said, I'm going to send you something. Apologies if it's a bit rough. And I said, I do this all the time. Yeah. Please be aware that 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 what's smooth in nature started off as rough and that, that it's yeah. it's contact with other with other things that makes something smooth. So mm. I wouldn't expect it to be any different. And yet yeah. we, we we almost breed a fear in students sometimes. Absolutely. So, and, um, so I mean, I, I have I, I try and get that over to them. Do not be afraid of fear. Do not be afraid of uncertainty. And maybe Thank we can you. correspond further on this, Mark yes. and Chilean. Thank you very much. Main down and <laughs> I think it's the the certainty. The a university in England changed its logo a few years ago to uh, have after the name of the university, University of X. Uh, it, had, it added a full stop to the logo uh, because it said it wanted to be more definite, more assertive. So it's now the university of full stop, sort of like a mic drop that young people have. It's so definite. And I contrasted that with a, a colleague who writes about loneliness uh, with that he likes, the, as I do, the poems of Emily Dickinson, who will often end a poem with a dash. And Dickinson's dash is an anti full stop, yeah. is a, I'm just stopping here, but things carry on, life carries on without me as it did without, as it does without her. And she was more, uh, her dashes are better articulations of the ineffable than most people's words and is a very good example for me of poetic, the power of poetry, mm -hmm. but also the power of poetry not well to stop making those definite statements. And I wonder, I don't know Richard Rorty's work well. It, it doesn't surprise me, you said you were surprised it was all men that you'd decided. I think a lot of men, including academic men, think they're immortal until they find out they're not. Uh, whereas women are more likely to, I think Philip Larkin's an exception, he knew he was, he was mortal all his life. But this sense of this dash rather than this full stop, it seems a very macho thing for that university to have done to say, that's here we are, we are full stop, that's all that, all that needs to be said. Really it's a very masculine approach to yeah, immort immortal life. Very interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. Putting a full I'll tell step. you which university it is after this call. <laughs> of course, don't, don't do that. <laughs> um, but it, it's amazing because most logos, they don't have punctuation after them. That's very particular, very, very strange. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, out and you started off by saying people often say we are born alone and we die alone do you want to say an alternative to that or do you think that's right no i don't think it's right you know i, I think that i mean it's funny i i live by myself i'm possibly the only person here who lives by themselves i love living by myself and I, I feel less alone living by myself than I have done previously living with other people. Um, so I, 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 I don't know where that comes from. It's, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's not an academic, it's not a, 
it's a it's a it's a kind of folk truism we're born alone and we die alone i don't know where, i don't know what the origins are but i'm sure it resonates with with some of you it's not something that you've never heard before and i i i, I don't think it is the case um i love that 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 line from the trailer you know we walk with ghosts and we are we are who we are because of the people that have that we with whom we have associated even those who are no longer there um, I see Piotr wants to come in. Yeah, yeah, Piotr. Yes, uh, thank you uh, at first for the extraordinary lecture. I listened to uh, listen to it while sinking into the um, reflective uh, silence uh, it evoked in me. Uh, in fact, following Goethe, uh, one would like to say the moment lasts, you are so beautiful. Uh, I listened to so much that uh, I didn't feel uh, like joining in the discussion, but uh, let me try it. Uh, as I listened to your, um, your paper, I associated uh, Paul Oster's excellent essay entitled The Future of the, uh, the, Future of the World or uh, inventing solitude, uh, which contains two particular texts. Uh, the first one is entitled Portrait of an Invisible Man. And uh, this essay is an attempt to get uh, at the mystery, the um, essence of the life and personality of the writer's late father, uh, the father of Paul Oster's. Uh, the second essay is entitled Book of Remembrance or, or something like that. And it is a, a development of the first essay. It is a, a multi meditation introducing the most important motives of Oster's world. But above all, a moving uh, reverie of fatherhood, of loneliness, uh, the metaphysics of chance. And Oster beats himself up with thoughts about his father, uh, whom he loved, but about whom he unfortunately uh, uh, does not have the best memories. And despite this, however, he feels loneliness and longing in the wake of his death. He mm -hmm. also um, finds that uh, the loneliness is, um, uh, is triggered um, not only by the mere fact of the death of a loved person, but uh, by the objects he left behind, which constantly evoke uh, him uh, in our memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is an interesting thought that uh, shows that the word of uh, artifacts left behind by the deceased uh, on the one hand evokes loneliness, but on the other hand um, gives a sense of uh, their continued, um, uh, continued existence among us in the works, things, and memories they left behind us. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm just curious about your uh, uh, commentary about this. I wonder how you would comment uh, on this and thank you for the possibility of taking a voice. Thank you. I, um, I first want to say how heartened I was by what you said, first of all, um, which was how what I said um, resonated with you, opened up some space for the imagination, that images would come into your head, that you would think about other things. For me, that's what academic writing should do. It should do something to somebody or with someone. It should cause some, not simply a cognitive response, but an emotional response. It shouldn't just be about something. Uh, I, so I wanted to speak about something, but I also wanted to, the, the way I spoke about it to try and do something without being as 
sly or uh, duplicitous as Dennis Potter, because I, I'm not, you know, I'm what I, I I'm a, I think I'm a writer. Actually, I, I'm not a reader. I've got this job title, which is which is embarrassing, a reader. And actually, I was thinking of changing my email signature to slow reader, because I'm a desperately slow reader. Because like. Um, like Jillian, my background's in the humanities, and we would spend all morning. I can still remember, I still have a frisson, I won't tell you how many decades later, when the professor of German explained how a couple of lines of a Rilke poem, you know, the, the, the poem about the panther in the Jardin de Plante, how that worked. I can still get, when I think about it, I still have goose pimples. But you tell me about something I heard at an academic conference in the summer, I couldn't tell you anything. And I, I do not have any demented condition or anything. So academic work has to do something. It has to open up doors of the imagination. It's a form of, it's not a form of expression. It's a form of relationality. And I like to try, I like for there to be consonance between what I'm thinking or writing about and, and, how it's how it's received so it's it, for me writing is is a relational activity rather than i'm going to tell you about what i can't bear this you know what would foucault have said and and, and you know I, I just this ventriloquism I, I mean i can't i did hear once in a conference what would foucault have said and then in a terrible put down to somebody, you know how adversarial academic life is, Nietzsche would turn in his grave. How do you know? So I nearly ran away from that particular conference. So I, I can't comment on, on Paul Oster, only to mention one coincidence, that in this writing I'd be doing around this, I've been drawing on um, Siri Hustvet, his wife's work, her collection of essays on um it's called women looking at Me women looking at men looking at women essays on art and aesthetics and uh so it's quite interesting that there's a there's a kind of paul oster um siri hustvet connection but thank you so much for sharing some of the stuff that went on for you. I mean, I think that's just, again, it's just so generous and I can't reply to the, because we're not doing that fencing. We, have, we haven't got the foils out and, you know, <laughs> I say he said this, but no, he said, really said this. And I'm wanting to say, what's the, what has it got to do with us? What's it got to do with our woundedness as human beings? You know, our, 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 the animals that we are, that, that, that live in time, that we, you know, we are time. So thank you for this generous um, contribution, Piotr. And thank you, Piotr. You mentioned you, the also. artifacts that last beyond us, so I see your hand. And I like that I, idea. And it can be written words or other, I mean, it goes back to Plato, at least, the idea that you gain a, a touch of immortality by teaching because other people live beyond and have been influenced and by having children and through other things but what we leave uh, Dennis Class writes about continuing bonds so when people have died there are continuing bonds uh, I was uh, the the handbook of solitude silence and loneliness that several people here have contributed to uh, I wanted to invite uh, Dennis Class to contribute because of his work on continuing bonds rather than this death is just the end and it's on you're on your own uh, sadly he's died so although there are continuing bonds he can't write a chapter from wherever his continuing bonds are so he couldn't contribute to the handbook uh, in the time so I discovered that and that's part of the, uh, the tension as it were Douglas Hofstadter a very mm. unlikely person to write on this talks about his mother grieving their, their father, I think, and she says, all I have is photographs. 
and she says, but you have the music of Chopin. She was a pianist, she played the piano. You have the music of Chopin. When you play Chopin, you, you read the notes. And he says, those notes are like, he, the phrase he uses, these notes are soul shards, oh. like little fractions of Chopin's soul. And when you play Chopin, you are engaging with these soul shards, which I think is a beautiful poetic phrase for such a technical, logical, and yet poetic philosopher. But these soul shards, so the photograph is a, a shard, is a fraction. These artifacts, as Piotr say, are, can be described as fractions or broken pieces of soul or Frag parts of. Yeah. Fragments. The most poignant fragment when you were talking, Piotr, I, I remembered clearing out my mother's house after she died, some 30 years after my father, and coming across a, a diary, my father's diary, his, his you know, and his ha seeing his handwriting, and then the blank pages, you know, the sporadic appointments, things he was trying to finish, trying to do. And then the blank pages for the rest of the year, the diary of, you know, of, of that year he died. So yeah. absolutely. And music yeah. take us right back to a moment, a particular piece of music can transport us back in time to a particular uh, moment. Thank you. And maybe uh, this we goodness me, look at the time. Uh, maybe this could be David. It's all right. I've seen your hand. Um, uh, we we also need to be aware of our finitude as a finitude as a as a seminar. Uh, but David, a short question perhaps. Well, it's just a short thing. Living in the present, something that's come up and has struck me about the the examples. There's Dennis Potter, which struck me as as you know earlier as as very significant in this context. Philip Larkin, who, as Julian knows, I was also a colleague with, a very junior colleague when I first came to Hull in the 1960s, and he was a senior colleague and very much a made person and acting up to his perception of how he would play that role. And add another to it, or perhaps another two, one who, again, I know, but intermittently, we were at school together, um, and uh, that is David Hockney, someone whose work has always been leading edge, experimental, taking risks. If you meet him, he shares one other attribute with both Larkin and Potter, that is, he is a miserable bugger. And uh, I want you um, and to consider the extent to which, and, and T, of T.S. Eliot, this was also said, uh, there are people who are great in their own uh, time on the stage, but they can be seriously off-putting in interpersonal relations and uh, they're not the they're not always the person you want to go and, and spend time with and that's what they do they, they know that so masking i think the mask of depression the mask of knowing your glass may be half full but it actually suits the role you're playing in this kind of company to say oh actually it's it's more than half empty it's it's almost empty and draining away and uh the other thing that has also struck me i don't know if it's true of t.s Eliot, is that all of the other three were heavy smokers certainly during the time so is it a more positivistic uh, uh, sort of riff on this that says uh um uh people who know how to use their solitude tend to be heavy smokers because that's the thing you can do to yourself, you do your, you're doing your own harm to yourself. You know, you're you're a person of good intellectual quality, so you know what you're doing. Why are you doing that? Why are you trying to kill that thing in yourself, which is living and life, and also to go around? Or is it just that smoking a lot makes you feel really miserable? Wow. <laughs> and you must be able to solve this. <laughs> Absolutely not. That is a, a not. I, I, but I just like to assure you that I am not a miserable bugger. I'm actually <laughs> fairly upbeat. You know, quite a lot of time. Although, you know, I dip. But I'm not a miserable bugger. And um, no, you know, no, no, judge if we. Are. You have the privilege of being able to judge these people in the rounder, not in the round, in the rounder. 
but I mean, we, we draw on, on many people in our work and we have no idea, you know, they could be, you know, they could be wife beaters. But I, I think I just read this lovely essay, sorry, by George Saunders, who describes being stuck in writing a story about a barber. Then he decided that he needed to give the barber one of his defects. The barber he typecast as a misogynistic, prejudiced, miserable bastard. And he couldn't finish the story. He couldn't write the story. He decided to amputate two of his toes and he suddenly became more human. He could, he could see himself in that person. So for a moment, I could see myself in David Potter. I can see myself in my father, who, yes. you know, was a complex individual. So let's leave it at that. Um, and I can see myself in Richard Rorty, so, which enabled me to draw on them, yeah, for my own purposes. So I, I don't think, I think it's beside the point that um, Potter was was a miserable bastard and they were all smokers in a sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we should all uh, we could quote continue this discussion, but <laughs> next time we'll quote Benson and Hedges as well. The <laughs> little smoking joke there. Thank you so, Anne. Thank you so much. You have opened so many cans of worms, as it were, to to continue the analogy, uh, and and opened us up, I think, to many issues and ideas. It's been. Uh, wonderful for me, and I think others have said that as uh, that as well. Thank you so much. You'll be pleased to know none of us are experts on solitude. It is precisely the, the subject that we are together being not expert with. So you're in good company being amongst people who are also interested. And we, we will finish with a dash like Emily Dickinson Thank you. Uh, in that way. And that's how we want send to me, be. Send me all strength for Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. And I hope it goes well on Saturday Thank for you your friend. Thank, Thank you, everyone, so much. For Thank you. Thank you so much. It was uh, very we'll nice being here. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you very much for today's Bye -bye. meeting. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.